On today's episode of Sound Iron Sessions, we're going to be looking at a track in the style of Resident Evil 7's Biohazard, so stick around. Hey, how's it going everybody? This is Craig Peters here from Sound Iron, and in today's edition of Sound Iron Sessions, we're going to be looking at a track that was very inspired by Capcom's Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. And this was actually a demo that I wrote for our recent upgrade for Strut Grand. So before we begin dissecting this track, I really want to encourage you to subscribe to the Sound Iron YouTube channel. This is a great way for you to stay up to date on future walkthroughs, compositional breakdowns, composer interviews, as well as videos like these. So make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe and let us know what you guys think about the videos. Leave a comment. Let us know what you guys want to see in future Sound Iron sessions as well as other videos as well. This library has a lot of prepared piano sounds and clustered piano sounds and as I was playing through the different samples and the presets of the library, I got very inspired as it started making me think, man, this would be a really cool track to do in this kind of style as I'm a big fan of the game and uh, it's a really awesome game in the way that they approached it as well. For this score, the composers wrote it in a style called Music Concrete and they used a lot of binaural recordings of bees, human voices, atonal orchestra, found sounds, and many others. Music Concrete is essentially where you record a bunch of sound effects and then use these recorded elements in a more musical way. For this score, it was also done by a few different composers, including lead music composer Akiyuki Morimoto, as well as composers like Chris Velasco, Brian de Oliveira, and others. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in, check out the track, and then I'll show you guys what libraries I use and how I wrote it. So this track pretty much kicks off with some brown noise, and this was inspired by watching the Song Exploder episode with Trent Reznor and Nine Inch Nails and how he was talking about how he wrote the song Hurt. And he was very inspired by David Lynch movies like Eraserhead, how there's these like radiator sounds that are going on throughout the movie, or just a lot of like uneasy, unsettling sounds. And I thought it'd be cool to sort of have this in there, just more in the background, to just more start it off on that uneasy, unnerving feeling and just kind of have it fading in and out throughout the track. So by itself it sounds like this. And you can see right here I'm just automating the volume knob. So one of the sounds within Struggran that really sort of led me on this journey of doing a track in this style was this uh, mal effects that come within Struggran. And it just sounds really cool by itself. It's like these clustered piano sounds. And you can see that it's just kind of sprinkled throughout the track. And uh, I'll go ahead and show you how this sounds by itself. Like it just has such a cool sound to it. You just play different notes and you get different clusters. Yeah, and I just thought that was such a cool sound, so that was pretty much the, the focal starting point of this track. And then moving on, the next track that I'm using is an effects preset called Death Clock, and this is also from Strut Grand. And this is pretty much acting as just like a percussive, creepy loop, 
But the cool thing about this effects preset is that there's a lot of cool stuff going on with the mod wheel. So as you increase the mod wheel, you start to hear some other sounds coming in. So I'm just going to go ahead and solo this track for you and let you hear what's going on. So you can see that there's some other sort of like little reverse sounds in there. There's also another little percussive element that you hear creeping in. So you have this dun, dun, and then you hear this kind of like clicking going on in the back. So I thought that was really cool and definitely helped set the tone for the track. So the next track in the piece is an effects preset called The Dark Room. And I pretty much just wanted to kind of like sprinkle this in throughout the track. I didn't want too many of these kind of atonal dark elements stepping on top of each other. So for this one, you can see I'm just kind of using it sparingly, but I'm going to go ahead and solo this so you can hear how it sounds by itself. I also got some reverb and delay on it. Just kind of playing some dark haunting kind of creepy stuff. So let's go ahead and listen to these two effects presets by themselves. I'll go ahead and put the mallet effects in there as well. Scary stuff. All right, so the last effects preset that I use is one called Ghost Rider. And this is a really cool one. It's using some new features that we've added within the Strut Grand upgrade and also to future upgrades as well. And this one's really cool because it's got this Gliss and Strum mode. And for this one, it's using Gliss. I have the scale set to a double harmonic minor. And then the, right here, it's set to direction as far as the, for the way the arpeggiator works. And then I have the rate set all the way up. It's just cranked. And it sounds like this. So you can pretty much just hit one key and get this kind of thing. So let me go ahead and load this up and show you. So you can hear it's a super cool preset and definitely lends its way to the horror genre and works really well in this track, I think. So one of the things that always stood out to me about the Resident Evil 7 soundtrack is the use of different reverse sounds. So towards the beginning of the track, I'm using sounds from Rust and I wanted to incorporate some of those more reverse type sounds. So one quick and dirty way to do that is to just go under the hood. And what I did is I selected all the groups and then I just hit reverse. And that's a really easy way to get some quick reverse sounds out of contact without having to bounce anything reverse the wave and putting effects and doing all that stuff. You can do that and it's a cool way to have a little bit more manual control over it, but this is how I did it, just a real quick way. So that way when you're playing sounds, you just automatically get those reversed effects. And I also have some reverb and delay from uh, Send on here as well. So let's go ahead and listen to up until this point. So I also applied the same approach to Sick One. Since they use a lot of voice actors in the soundtrack and with the whole approach to the score, just getting these voice actors to do a bunch of really crazy and wild things. I believe there was a point where they said, you act like you're a, a zombie cow and you're dying. You know, what kind of sounds would that make? I don't know. Sounds pretty wild. But for this one, since Sick One has this preset right here called Madness, it has a lot of really cool, just like weird and uneasy voice things. So let's just go ahead and listen to this by itself. And let's go ahead and hear a little bit of this in context. So I definitely wanted to incorporate that human element as well and really I think helps for just kind of creating that Resident Evil 7 vibe. 
And then around measure four, I start to incorporate these flotando string articulations, and these are from our newest Hyperion Strings solo violins library, which is the newest addition to our Hyperion line. And this one, I really like this articulation because I feel like you can use it for more softer, delicate type arrangements, whether you're doing something really emotional, but I definitely feel that used in the right way can definitely be used for horror. And uh, there was a couple things that I did with this. So I have this same note being played on the first violin and the second violin and they're panned, one's panned a little bit to the left and one's panned a little bit to the right. And one of the things that I did was I played around with the pitch wheel. So they're kind of going in and out of pitch both at different times, which uh, definitely helps to add to that unease feeling. So let's just go ahead and listen to, this is just the first violin. You hear it starts to fade in. You can hear it start to kind of go in and out of pitch. And then we got the second violin. So you can start to hear where they go in and out of tune from each other and I really like that kind of constant of being just a little bit out of tune just so it always has that sort of dissonant tension going on. And then another articulation from Hyperion String Solo Violins that I'm using are these tremolo staccatos and I love how these sound, they're really cool. And I'm pretty much just using these throughout the track as well, very sparingly. So let me go up here to a little part and hear how it sounds with the other flatando strings. And I like that the actual articulation is recorded. So it's not really meant to be like playing a tremolo and then stopping it. So it has a very natural decay in the way that it ends. So with the chords and the chord structure of this track, there's no real melodic structure at all. It's very dissonant, very clustery and atonal and dissonant. It's like you can see some of these chords here, they're just kind of spread out clusters. So no, no melodic anything going on with this track, really. It's all about mood and just how scary can you make it. And then I'm also using Hyperion Strings Elements, and the only articulation I'm using from this library is the tremolos, and I'm using these on the violins, the violas, the cellos, and the basses. And I'm just kind of swelling these in, really just keeping to that cluster thing as well. It's just there's no real you know, chord at all. It's really just these dark clusters, and it sounds like this. And I only used the tremolo effect maybe about four times within the track and really just kind of feeling like, okay, if you were the player in the game and you're going around different corners, you know, you don't know where the threats are. So when you sort of hear these kind of sounds, you have that kind of feeling in the back of your head, like, oh, maybe there is like a threat around the corner, or, you know, or some kind of danger. So uh, I really liked how these sounded in combination with the Hyperion string solo violins. And of course, you definitely don't need these string libraries to accomplish this feel. You can definitely use whatever you have at your disposal. And then the last track of this piece is using sounds from Rust 2. And I was thinking it'd be cool to swell in with some of these different metal bunker sounds and really thinking about this in the way that, okay, if, you know, with a lot of video game music, you have different levels of sound. So maybe you have like the overall music track and then you might have like a threat level or a danger level or, you know, like maybe your low health level, that sort of thing. So with this sound, I was thinking it'd be kind of cool, a cool way to end the track, but also thinking if I was working on a video game or something and I wanted to have some kind of sound for when, you know, maybe there's a, a really heavy threat coming or, you know, things are getting real. I wanted to use some kind of sound like that and I thought this was really fitting and this is how it sounds by itself.
So pretty simple, it's just really fading in these kind of big metal hits just over and over and just gradually increasing more and more. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the mixing and mastering for the track. So for this track, I really didn't do too much as far as the different EQ and mixing and that sort of thing, but I do have a few different things that I did. So for the string reverb, I'm using the cinematic rooms. And then I also have this EQ on here, just pretty much filtering out some of the different low end that I don't really need on my reverb. So for the effects track for the percussion, I'm using this Valhalla Vintage Verb. And these are the settings that I'm using for that. And I really just wanted to keep it simple, you know, just using effects tracks to send all the different instruments to. It kind of makes it easy, especially when you're doing any sort of exporting for a lot of different types of stems and tracks. So let's go ahead and listen to this element without the reverb and the delay. So you see it just kind of ends. But when we turn on the reverb, kind of adds a little bit more ambience and then the delay really helps kind of pan it around back and forth and make it a little bit more stereo interesting. Here it just kind of trails off through the left and right. I thought that was a really cool sound. And then I'm pretty much just using the same approach through the different instruments, depending on which ones I wanted to be a little bit more affected. I uh, would play around with the different send levels. So, you know, for some I wanted to be a little bit more quiet. Some I wanted to be a little bit more uh, soaked in the different verb and, and delay. Then I would do that. And then as far as the mastering goes, it's pretty much what you've seen on previous Sound Iron sessions. I got Goldfoss on here. And I usually have some general, you know, template settings that I use and maybe just play around with them accordingly. These are the settings that I use for what you're hearing right now. And then I'm also using the Slate Virtual Mix Rack and I got this trimmer on here, which is just helping me get some headroom. And then I'm also using this Virtual Mix Bus just for introducing some more console style, like analog saturation, that sort of thing. And then we got the SSL G Comp from Waves, my favorite go-to mix bus compressor. And the settings I generally use are, you know, attack on 30, the release on auto, Sometimes with a ratio, I usually have it either two to one or four to one. For this one, I have it as two to one. And then I just go ahead and play with the threshold to you know, have it sit somewhere between zero and four right here on this meter. And then we got some virtual tape machine, and this is just another element to kind of introduce some more of that kind of tape analog sound. Um, you know, I don't know how much it's really doing. I mean, that's one of those things like analog gear versus digital analog gear, you know, but I like how it sounds. I think it sounds cool. And then we got a little bit of EQ going on, and this is pretty much just kind of helping shape the overall mix. I uh, got a little bit of a low shelf up here as well as a cut, and then I also have this high shelf, and then a few different elements over here scooped out just to help kind of bring a little bit of clarity to the track. And as far as getting my overall level, I do it in a couple different stages. So I'm using Flatline, and these are the settings I have for this. I have the threshold on minus 8.96, I have the shape around 96%, so it's not fully flattened out, but just, you know, has a little bit of, you know, softness as far as the shape goes. And then I'm also using it in combination with Ozone 9. And then I also have a few other things going on with these different modules. So right here, I got the exciter going on. These are some of the settings that I have for that. And this is just to kind of add a little bit of that harmonic saturation, harmonic excitement, whatever you want to call it. I got an imager going on just to help sort of widen out the sound a little bit. And then the main thing that I have going on here is this maximizer. And this is pretty much just being used, like I said, in combination with Flatline, just to kind of get that overall level. All right, so that about wraps up this episode of Sound Iron Session. If you want to learn more about the libraries that I used in this demo, make sure to go to soundiron.com. I want to thank you all so much for watching. If you like these videos, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to stay up to date on all future videos like these. So until next time, I just want to say thanks again, and we'll catch you in the next one. Take care.